Well, it's time now to bring in our panel of party commentators for their wisdom and, well, their wit too, I suppose. W with me tonight, uh, Jeff Turner, who's a Liberal commentator, Tim Powers is a Conservative commentator, and Robin McLaughlin is an NDP commentator. Good to see you all. Good to be here. Uh, fast moving developments here on the, on the coronavirus story, um, Jeff, and, and how the government's dealing uh, with this uh, situation, uh, World Health Organization today declaring it a global emergency now. Uh, and, you know, is there more the government could be doing on this? It's starting to get some criticism now for, you know, trying to get the Canadians out of China and why that's taking so long and some of the screening issues. Uh, if you could give them any advice, what would it be or just stay the course? Well, it's a fast-moving problem. I think they've mm -hmm. been handling it competently uh, since uh, it became a, a major issue, I think less than a week ago, mm -hmm. really, in terms of an international issue. Um, I think the flow of information coming out of China is slower than it may be elsewhere, and that's causing complications. And then having to be able to uh, reach out to those Canadians who are affected in country and who may wish to have consular assistance or wish to be evacuated from the country, uh, how you deal with that is obviously the next challenge. They've secured a plane to be able to pull people back who want to come, but that opens up a whole other series of questions around quarantining or other uh, other tests to make sure people are healthy before they get on that plane uh, and what happens to them when they get back to Canadian soil. We have, mm. we have three cases confirmed today in Canada and a plane coming back presents risks, but I'm sure the government is working very diligently to manage those risks. One of the, and you've all got some experience in crisis communication and I guess one of the challenges in crisis communication, Tim, is to try and stay ahead of the story, And but a story like this is hard to stay ahead of. Really. Well, but, uh, but also be responsible in the information you provide and in fairness to the government, I think they're doing okay. Uh, the, the one area where maybe they need to address is am I at risk it's a question you keep hearing it was a discussion at our lunchroom table today people are trying to figure out as emergencies get called am I personally in my space at risk what do I need to do and I don't know if there's an easy and clear answer to that so I think more focus on addressing that particular personal anxiety. Look, I've seen uh, the, the health minister out there, Minister Haidu, I've heard mm -hmm, yep. the health uh, officials in Ontario come forward. They're, they're competent in what they're saying it, and that they seem to be fully aware and, and, and on top of things. So it, it's hard to know how this is going right now, other than that, I feel they're doing okay. Yeah, so from a crisis communication standpoint, uh, generally the, the principles are to be informative, authentic, uh, and to um, be available, uh, so transparent. Uh, the challenge with this type of a crisis is you don't know where this is going to end up. Mm -hmm. And what we would always tell a, a client dealing with crisis communication is figure out where it's going to end and get there first. Right. So here you can't. So what you can do, though, is to be forthright, to share information uh, in a responsible manner, uh, and to make sure that you're answering the questions that, as Tim touched on, are happening around the kitchen table, uh, as well as that are coming from the media. Uh, and I think so far, I mean, it's hard to judge in a situation like this. I've seen nothing the government's done that hasn't been uh, in line with that. Uh, the other thing, too, is Canada has an experience with this from the mm -hmm. SARS crisis uh, back in 2006, I believe. Mm -hmm. So to demonstrate that we've learned from the lessons uh, of that, and I think in particular in Toronto, we're seeing that, Toronto Public Health uh, and the medical experts leading the way, and, and not just um, reassuring and providing information, but saying these are the systems we've put in place uh, and why we're in a different situation now than we were back in 2006. Okay. Um, let's move on from that. Let's talk about the uh, Conservative leadership race. Tim, let me, let me start with you here. I think what's you know, been really interesting to me in the last little while is to, a couple of things. Who's decided not to run? Uh, who's still being rumored about running? And I guess, I, I guess it leads me to ask this question. I mean, there was a big push to get rid of Andrew Scheer, and now nobody's particularly, there's a lot of dissatisfaction <laughs> with who wants to replace him. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I guess what's, well, what's that all about? A, I think there's a bigger conversation, Peter, to be had that we're seeing play out in the conservative leadership, but it's playing itself out in other political parties about who wants to lead and what are you, what are you trading off to lead? I mean, you look at Mr. Charest, uh, Rana, Pierre Polyev, all very capable in different ways. You can fight about their politics. All, all said no when at least all three of them were seriously considering it. Um, clearly, for different reasons, uh, they didn't. Yeah, didn't I think I mean that's important, right? Some of them are they 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 don't want to get back into that political. Well, and I think all, the re some all of the some reasons of them were legitimate. They and I think there's a win. bigger statement about what is this job that I'm taking on. But that's a longer conversation for today. As it relates to the current race, look, I I, I think in Mr. O'Toole and 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 Peter McKay and Marilyn Gladu, you have uh, you have one clear tier one candidate, Peter McKay, who's a well known quant 
quantity. Uh, Aaron O'Toole finished third the last time. He's an interesting quantity. Uh, quantity. Uh, Marilyn Gladu and and there's some others. I'm not being disrespectful by not naming them. I just don't remember their names at the moment, which maybe tells you. Uh, but it's uh, I I think the fee may be an issue, which isn't a bad thing either. I think the intent of putting it at three hundred thousand dollars was. Uh, to make sure there weren't pretenders in. So we have some candidates who may be classified as pretenders, but do they hang on until till the end of March? It isn't the race the Conservatives right. want at the moment, but I think it will be judged to pick up on a point Robin made on what the outcome looks like. If Peter McKay wins and he's in there, I, I think generally people will be pleased with that in con the Conservative Party. Jeff, what do you think watching this from the sidelines? Well, much like Tim, I mean, who, who's been getting out has been the story in the last week and a half because those big uh, common names, common household names have all opted not to enter with the exception of Mr. McKay. And we are all waiting to see if there is a, a name left one. that can wade back into the Tony Clement out here. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, they keep yeah. floating John Baird's name, but. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and John Baird's name's been in a lot of places in the last few weeks, hasn't it? As the, the chair of Pierre Polyev's uh, boarded campaign, as the, the uh, simultaneously providing advice to the party on where they may have gone wrong in the last election, so he seems to be a, a name that everybody's using in the last few weeks. Um, but I think uh, the, the Conservatives have an age-old problem, and, and many political parties do sometimes, which is what does it take to win the party leadership, yeah. mm -hmm. and what does it take to win a general the election, the country, the mood of the people. And those two things, I think the further you get, as a Liberal, I'll say the further you get down the <laughs> ideological me. spectrum of a party on, the, on either end of those spectrums, the, the harder it is to convince the sort of bedrock members of those movements that to move more to the middle. Whereas That's the Liberal, I'd say we yeah. often capture the whole right. middle and we find the middle even better. Rob, what are your thoughts on, on what yeah, you're seeing here? I'd pick up where, where Jeff was there because regardless of what leadership it is, you see this in the United States during the primary season, you've got to then f be able to pivot uh, to win the country. And the challenge for the Conservatives leadership last time was interesting because it was a really narrow uh, battle there mm -hmm. with Andrew Scheer just winning on the last ballot. The only ballot he led on was the last ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there wasn't much of a pivot to win the country. And we saw that uh, in the election. In fact, the only kind of excitement of wind in their sails going into the election was the challenges the Liberal government were facing as a result of SNC-Lavalin. Where I think the challenge for the, the Conservatives are now is having an actual real leadership race, first of all. Um, if Peter McKay runs away with this, whether it's because of the rules or because not enough people throw their hat in, um, will he have allowed himself enough room to pivot uh, to win the country? Because we saw already all candidates have now said they're against carbon pricing. They're going to get rid of the carbon tax. Uh, it wasn't just Andrew Scheer's opposition to same-sex marriage and uh, kind of his social conservative values that I think hurt them. It was also the fact that they weren't speaking the language of uh, many uh, voters in Ontario and Quebec in the right. East around the environment. And that's the number one issue for many most Canadians. Robin had a key point. What, what, they've all jumped on the fact that they're going to get rid of Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. And I think that, that, uh, that that's different than being for some form of carbon pricing. But I agree with Robin. They're not going to get to that until after they get through the leadership. The other thing that I think could actually happen here, Peter, is we get to March 26th. And March 27th is the day you've got to put that other $200,000 right. down. And people look and say, you know what, uh, I'm not really that close to it, or I have it, but I'm not going to win, so why am I going to put it down? This thing could be over in March. That is both problematic and potentially positive because it gives Peter McKay a longer window. So you're saying, window a, you're saying a, a McKay coronation if, if it's going to be anybody. It, yeah, look, if Peter, if it's Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole and Marilyn Gladue and nobody else has entered the race and it looks, the other candidates look and see that, you know, I've got to spend another $200,000 to win and they haven't been able to raise that money, this thing may be over in March and then a quicker pivot to other issues can happen. Mm. Good. My only other thought about this pivoting business and, and coming out of the Ontario uh, political world and watching Patrick Brown win the leadership using a very yeah. lot of social conservative values, anti-carbon tax uh, language, even before that was cool. And, and, and selling a pile of memberships. And well, let's be clear. Oh, I mean, absolutely. You know, yeah. there, it, there's different though. There, than that yeah, race. yeah, but but you there's you know selling. winning votes in the country <laughs> is different than winning a, a leadership because yeah, it's all about getting members to vote for you. Sign up a bunch of members and get them to vote. Right. My my, my doe-eyed wish though is perhaps maybe in 21st century politics we stop to the point where you win a leadership by promising all, including the, the U.S. primary system, you, you win a leadership by promising a bunch of stuff you never intend to do. 
Uh, and then when you actually have to face the regular people to vote for you, you pivot to what is what we can all agree probably a more sensible platform. And so I, I just I, I kind of wish that hopefully we don't see that in this conservative race. Um, maybe I wish as a liberal that we see it because it will cause a further <laughs> schism if they do that pivot after the fact. Uh, but just as a citizen, I would love to see us move to a place where leaders aren't just by rigor extend, mm -hmm. you know, expected to uh, to to take certain positions and then just abandon them when it when it becomes convenient. And let me just finish on on this before we move on to a final subject. Is that this this battle? Uh, it intrigues me about, and it's kind of in all parties, but where, you know, how do you, it's one thing to win a leadership, but again, how do you win the country? And the way you win the country is by expanding the base mm -hmm. of your supporters at election time, right? And so there's this debate that I'm hearing in the Conservative Party now about, well, is it a red Tory or I'm a true blue Tory and I'm going to cons consolidate the base and expand the base. But to win, don't Conservatives actually need to go after that 10 or 12 percent of people who didn't vote for them? Uh, you know, I mean, they won the popular vote, but you need to make big inroads around urban centers and particularly yep. around Toronto. And so for conservatives, are, are they thinking to themselves, I want a guy who's going to drive the base and the things I really believe, or is it a guy who's going to go get those people, stick to conservative policies and win those people who have voted conservative in the past and are prepared to again, but they're typically somewhere left to center. Where, where the Stephen Harper model, and this is the only place where I believe it has a parallel here, is Stephen Harper's success was he built a coalition. I think conservatives need to build a new coalition and different topologies are at play. If they want to win the country, yes, there needs to be that urban connection. It's the, the, you go back to the last leadership race and the disconnect with millennial voters and now zillennial voters is pretty pronounced as we saw in the last uh, campaign. So it, it's wonderful to stick with older voters. Uh, oh. Guess what? They're also dying. Uh, and, uh, not to scare anybody watching tonight, of course, so that this is their last night on earth. But, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the coalition needs to be about broadening. Thank God he's not the health minister during this crisis. Uh, Thank God he's not writing for the party leadership. Yeah. What I Vote for add, me now while you can. Yeah, exactly. You know, I see you know, lots of grandmothers and grandfathers in climate change protests, just for the record. Yeah. I'm glad Tim <laughs> juxtapositioned how Harper did it to how the next leader needs to do it, because I think the Harper model worked in a unique situation. It was very incremental growth to get to that coalition, and it also worked when the Liberal Party was in one of its worst situations, I think, nationally. Uh, now, if you look at the results of the 2015 election, uh, and the and I always bring electoral reform into this, the fact that I think there's a voting uh, coalition out there, progressives, that whether there's a new electoral system or not, they'll find a way to oppose old guard conservative regressive policies. So what this conservative does is exactly what you've talked about. How do you mirror the mirror marry the conservatives in the West in Alberta and their mm -hmm. fiscal conservatives and their anger right now at Ottawa with the people around the 905 and in Quebec yep. who have conservative values. And you can only do that if you reconcile position on the environment uh, and, and, uh, and same-sex marriage and other uh, equality Quick, issues. A final word to you on that and on where you go get these voters. I mean, uh, you're a liberal, but we're talking about conservatives, yeah. but it's the same sort of political science. Uh, I mean, I followed uh, Ken Bossenkool, a notable conservative, had a, had a note today, but focused on leadership numbers rather than general numbers numbers and it was if you imagine that 10% of conservative members are these social conservatives that we are all talking about um, but you need to find that 10% of new conservative members to bring you into that other place yeah. in the GTA he suggests that's just a canceling out and why would you do that as a way of growing the party as opposed to trying to have both of those camps I don't think that's possible to have both those camps but if you if you uh, focus beyond that I think the point stands that you need to broaden that coalition to win the election and a leadership contender needs to really really focus on that all right thank you all ahead of time Thank you. Thank Talk you. to you again. Thank you.